Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Dennis Doda. Dr. De- or Mr. Dennis Doda, nice to have you with us. You know, you're normally a, a videographer. You're on TV. And, oh. uh, but we're missing Tracy. She's out on assignment. But nice to have you with us Thank today. Thank you, sir. Well, the genome, you've heard about it. It's defined as a complete set of genes or genetic material inside a cell or, of an, or-, or an organism. Now, when it comes to humans, the genome carries a mind-boggling amount of information. Three billion pairs of DNA letters are carried inside a human's... How many cells? Do you have have any idea how many cells inside the body? Only because you left a note for me here. That's the only reason I would know. 100 trillion. That's even higher than the debt, the U.S. (laughs) debt. Now, since the final sequencing and mapping of the human genome was finished around 2003... Researchers have been exploring how this new understanding of the genome might be used for the early detection of diseases like heart disease, Alzheimer's, even cancer. Here to discuss the human genome is genomics expert Dr. Richard Winchelbaum. Dr. Winchelbaum is the director of the Pharmacogenomics Program in the Center for Individualized Medicine at the Mayo Clinic right here in Rochester. Dr. Winchelbaum, We've been waiting forever to have you on this program. Great to have you with us. Nice to be here. You know, you have been at this for a long time. Um, Tell us why uh, you got interested in uh, genomics and what you're doing. Well, you're the first person to ever ask me that question. Uh, (laughs) I I took a fruit fly genomics course at the University of Kansas as I was getting ready to go to medical school. And I thought, this is fascinating. It's going to be part of the future. Now, frankly, did I really think that during my career we would have the entire sequence of the human genome? I thought that would happen someday. But the fact that it happened very, as you just pointed out, early in the 21st century is amazing. And what's really exciting is that I think the way the press portrayed that was a race to the finish line to get to the finish of the human genome. No, no. It was a race to the starting line. And what's happening now is we're using that information in medicine and in pharmacogenomics being only one aspect of that to try and do a better job of diagnosing and treating our patients. It's really exciting to have a chance to take part in all of this. So the first time that you had anything to do with the, with the genome was the fruit fly when you were in medical school. Uh, no, it was even before I was in medical school. Oh, college. <laughs> in college. You know, some of our listeners probably have heard of DNA or that they have genes that aren't made by Levi's, um, or they know they have chromosomes. But what are those things, and how does that fit into what we're now referring to as the genome? Well, basically, in the course of evolution, we all have these only four letters, A, G, T, C, that are these so-called nucleotides that are the way we encode all the proteins in our body. And the genome is the way we, basically a book that has all of these letters written out. And we have about 20, 25,000 genes that genes encode messenger RNA. The messenger RNA makes proteins. The proteins do things in our, in our liver, in our brain, all over our body. And if there's a misspelling in one of those genes, that can cause trouble Sometimes it does good things, but most of the time it doesn't. So that can cause trouble. And some of the examples, I just was looking at a a manuscript that one of my colleagues and I wrote this morning where we picked one of the early examples of a miscoding in one of these genes and what that meant in the way we treat childhood leukemia. Now you're going to say, how in the world do you get from a couple of these letters being the wrong letters to childhood leukemia? Childhood leukemia is the number one cancer of kids. And when I was in medical school, what our students today would regard as the Paleolithic era when I was in medical school, (laughs) if we saw a child with childhood leukemia, that child, unfortunately, would not survive the next year or two. We Mm -hmm. had virtually nothing to do for them. I went to medical school at the same time you did, it sounds like. We're not going to compare Paleolithic (laughs) with Neolithic or anything like that. So, So as a matter of fact, my daughter, who's a pediatrician in North Carolina, if she sees these kids today, she can cure 95% of them. Wow. Now, I think that's a miracle. I, I'm sure that anyone would if you just sort of think about it. These are little three, four-year-old kids who have this disease. They're going to survive for the next 70 years because of drugs. So 
Mm-hmm. That's not radiation therapy. That's not surgery. It's drugs. Give us a scenario where knowing perhaps what genes are in that child could help them be paired with the proper medicine or treated in the in the proper sequence. I think you've been reading my mind. So, <laughs> so when we started doing the kind of research I'm talking about nigh 30, 40 years ago, it became clear that these drugs work that, that my daughter uses to cure childhood leukemia, but every now and then, these are powerful drugs. They do real damage. They have an adverse drug reaction that can wipe out their bone marrow, and the child can even die from the drug. We didn't understand why, and, and our laboratory asked about 30 years ago, could it be that there's a genetic variation in the genes that encode the protein your body uses to get rid of these powerful drugs? And the fact of the matter is, we found in one of these genes two misspellings that changed the encoded protein so it didn't work anymore, and the dose that a pediatrician like my daughter would use to treat these kids was 10 to 15 fold too high of a really powerful drug that can kill cancer cells, but also if you're giving a 10 fold overdose, not intentionally, nobody intended that to happen. It was because of a variation in a gene that the child got from mom and dad. And that gene called TPMT, and I won't tell you what that stands for, that gene (laughs) is really common in people who come from Northern Europe so that about one out of every 20 copies of that gene in Northern Europeans is this variant. So we need to know that to adjust the dosing of this drug. That's pharmacogenomics. We use the genomics to guide our therapy so we can avoid really bad things like inadvertently harming someone's child when we're using a drug that in most kids will cure their their cancer and also to maximize the efficacy, to try and get the best dose for that particular patient. Now, that amazes me. By the way, that gene that I'm talking about has never, ever been seen in anyone from East Asia. No one from China, Korea, or Japan. So we're all, as Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, and the guy who directed the Genome Project, like to say, all of us, every member of our species across the world is 99.9% identical at the level of our genome. That ought to make all of us behave better, but I'm afraid it doesn't. But, but as a matter of fact, we're all related to each other in that way. But those little bit of difference can make a big difference. We thought for years that we didn't need to worry about this kind of problem for these thiopurine drugs, which is what that thing. Now we know that there's a gene in East Asia, a totally different gene, that also has a problem. And the only place it's found in America is in the Native Americans because they came over the land bridge from Asia. Pretty incredible. So you can uh, figure out the, the, the leukemia patient's genome before they ever get any chemotherapy and identify those ones who are going to be more sensitive to the drug than others. And tailor the therapy. That's exactly right. We've been doing that here at Mayo. It's been a standard test since 1990. Absolutely incredible. We're talking about genomics with pharmacologist Dr. Richard Winchelbaum. Time for a short break. And when we come back, we're going to look on toward the future. We're going to talk with Dr. Winchelbaum about what's ahead in this very exciting field. You are listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic Radio News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Dennis Dota. We are back talking with genomics expert, Dr. Richard Winchelbaum. And so, doctor, what's next now in this field of genomics, would you say? Well, in terms of genomics is going to be important in every aspect of medicine. And and I know that all of us think immediately about cancer because cancer is a genomic disease, and there's no doubt that genomics will play a critically important role both in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. But as you might expect, I'd say, and and as a matter of fact, the facts are that the aspect of clinical genomics, actually applying this to patients, that eventually will touch every patient everywhere is pharmacogenomics. Because I just gave you an example of a drug that's used to treat childhood cancer. If you look on the Food and Drug Administration website, they now list 127 drugs that there's clinically actionable variation in our genome and that you would want to know about while being treated with drugs for the treatment of high blood pressure, cardiac disease, rheumatologic disease, psychiatric disease, virtually every disease. So what is really happening here is that we are now moving beyond one or two genes to put together panels where we use DNA sequencing 
to sequence all the genes that we currently know of have clinical importance for drug response, either to avoid serious adverse drug reactions like the bone marrow depression that I talked about with TPMT, or to maximize the efficacy of the drug. Some people need more drug than other people. Some people need less drug than other people. We know that. We, we've all talked to each other at cocktail parties about that. But as a matter of fact, now we can actually predict it and tailor the therapy. And the problem for the average doc is, this is 127 drugs. How do you keep all that straight, and how do you know what to do? And what we're doing today is putting that information in the electronic health record. So the fact that genomic information has developed in parallel with the use of computers, which is really what an electronic health record is, to store that information that no human being's brain can, can possibly handle, means that what's happening at all Mayo Clinic sites today, we have 17 different alerts that fire. If somebody's writing a <coughs> prescription for that thiopurine drug, immediately an alert will appear on the computer screen for the doctor saying, doctor, there is a genetic test. Would you like to order it? Now, that's not where we're going to go. That's what's happening today. It's happening with all 1.4 million patients that we see at Mayo Clinic. So right then, at the point of care, when the doctor's writing the prescription, an alert comes back to the doctor. You're kidding. And what we want to have happen is not for the alert to say, doctor, do you want to order a genetic test and wait for the result? We want to already have that information in the electronic health record. So it'll say, doctor, that patient, the one sitting with you right this minute, you should cut the dose in half, or you should double the dose. And nobody's going to remember that except for the electronic health record. And then we put all that information in there. So for 10,000 of our patients, local patients who gave us permission to do this, we're taking their DNA, we're sequencing all of the genes that we currently know of play a role in variation in drug response. Everything is listed on that FDA website that I talked about just a minute ago. And that will be there for these patients when they need the drug right at the point of care, and it, the computer will, the electronic health record, tell the doctor what to do next, which my daughter, who keeps me honest, says, Dad, do not give me all that genetic mumbo-jumbo. I've got a, a waiting room full of kids with earaches and urinary tract infections. I want to know, do I raise the dose, do I lower the dose, or do I get a different drug? And that's where we're trying to go. So uh, you, if you have the patient's genome... Uh, have identified that through, through a blood test, then you can determine what drug is most effective and what dose that patient should have. If, the, if we know that there are genetic variations, obviously it's up to the doctor to exercise his or her judgment about the selection of, if it's a depressed patient, of an SSRI, those are the standard of care drugs. But which one, and they're all metabolized by our bodies differently, it may be that one would not be good for one patient just because his or her body couldn't get rid of it, and they're going to have an overdose and have a bad side effect, stop taking the drug, and become suicidal. We don't want to see that happen. So what this will do is begin to make the life of the physician easier, and we won't interrupt the doctor and say, would you like to order a test, knowing that, that many of the tests will be negative. The information will be there. It will only be when it is clinically relevant for that individual patient. This is truly precision medicine or individualized medicine. So who, I mean, it sounds like all of us ought to have that on our medical record. Well, of course, I'm a little biased, but I happen <laughs> to think that, that that's where we're going. And now we're testing this with 10,000 patients so that we can determine, is this cost effective? And right now, it doesn't cost that much to do this kind of testing. We're not sequencing the entire genome. We're just capturing the genes that we know today that the Food and Drug Administration, this is not Dr. Winchelbaum, it's the Food and <laughs> Drug Administration has said, this gene is important for individual differences in the dosing or use of this drug. Mm. And we capture okay. those, sequence those, put that information in the electronic health record. And you can get that information from a blood test. From a blood test. You draw a blood sample, extract the DNA, send it through a DNA sequencer. It's easy for me to say this stuff because <laughs> it's very, very complicated to do. And then get that information into the electronic health record. That's the future that all of us are going to be seeing. And a computer does this. How long does it take uh, to go ahead and sequence an individual's genomic um, in, uh, in today's you know, world material the, I, and, and I let me emphasize again I was not talking about sequencing all three billion nucleotides 
we just capture about a million. Now that's a, just about a million, and then sequence them. Uh, that can be done in a matter of days, actually, in today's world. Wow. How much uh, uh, does it cost? You said it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, so, uh, and a patient shouldn't necessarily have it done until they are uh, have one of these diseases where you know that pharmacogenomics can help? No, no. What, what I was trying to say, and I'll say it very clearly now, we should do this in a preemptive fashion. Do I know? And I was talking to to uh, one of my colleagues today who's going to have orthopedic surgery and he was worried about anticoagulation. We know that many of the anticoagulant drugs show big genetic variations in response. Mm. And he was actually asking me questions because he was thinking about exactly this. We don't know who's going to need drug X, Y, or Z, but we do know the genes that play a role in all of these drugs, whatever drug you're prescribed. So the information should be parked in your electronic health record ahead of time and used only when it's relevant, when the doctor's writing the prescription. Now that sounds, I realize, like science fiction. It's already happening, and it's going to happen on a much broader scale. So that uh, realizing that I've devoted my career to pharmacogenomics, but this is an aspect of medicine which, where that kind of information, having it there, is just like vaccinating to prevent polio. Do patients who come to the Mayo Clinic now get this, uh, have their human genome checked and uh, become part of their medical record? The 10,000 patients whom I was just talking about are mm -hmm. local patients who were doing this in a research setting, but it will be used clinically. It's clinically usable. But for other patients, it is possible to order this kind of testing, yes. And are we doing it routinely, or will we be doing it routinely? It's, it is increasingly becoming routine. Oh, man. Pretty amazing stuff. It's incredible. And I know, you know, you and I being here on the campus of Mayo Clinic, we talk to doctors who are often studying, you know, applications for breast cancer, for example. And they say that it helps them keep from wasting their time with a particular drug that won't be metabolized by a fourth of the population. Or picking a drug that will benefit the patient and not using a drug that won't, and that, that actually applies in breast cancer. So when you are filling out the prescription uh, uh, on the computer, the computer will flash up a, uh, a sign, uh, a message, that this uh, for, for this particular condition, uh, there are... Uh, if we check the patient's genome, we can help you. We can help direct your therapy. And that's being done today. What we want to have done tomorrow is that it will say, for this patient, this particular patient, don't use this drug, use that drug. Absolutely incredible. Dr. Winchelbaum, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. We've been talking about genomics with the director of the pharmacogenomics program at the Center for Individualized Medicine at Mayo Clinic. He is Dr. Richard Winchelbaum. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure.